Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Devin Sears. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Micah Wood, and we are talking today about website caching. I suspect many of us, if we've gone through and had to troubleshoot a website, we've been told by technical support, clear your cache and cookies. And maybe you've known what that meant, and maybe you don't know what that means. But today, we're going to walk you through what exactly caching is, how it works, how it can improve your website experience, how it can take the load off of your server and improve the, the efficiency of your website and how to deliver, how to leverage it to deliver a better experience for your website visitors and the traffic that hits your website. So before we get too deep into the content, there's just a couple housekeeping items I want to touch on. As I mentioned before, we're joined by Micah Wood, who is an educator as well as an engineer manager engineering manager here at Bluehost, uh, as well as a um, a strong advocate in the WordPress community. I believe you're on the organizing team for WordCamp Atlanta, which is coming up just around the corner. So thank you for all that you do there. Um, as always, my name is Devin. I am the senior field marketing manager. I'll be your host today. Uh, once we get the housekeeping out of the way, I will turn off my screen and my mic, and I will do my best to respond to questions in the chat that comes in throughout today's presentation. If there are any questions or comments that I don't know the answer to or that I feel like would be beneficial for the rest of the, the attendees, then I'll hold those till the end of today's presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session where I'll come back on screen and we'll rapid fire ask Micah to answer some of the more um, the bigger questions that come in throughout today's presentation. So uh, before we get to that, let's just do a, a couple audio tests. So if you can hear us, find the chat box, which should be on the screen as well, and let us know where you're tuning in from. We love to hear where our audience is coming in from. And uh, it also lets us know that we are transmitting audio and that you can hear us. So please let us know. And if you found that chat box, that's great. You can give us feedback or comments as the as we go through everything today. There's also at the top next to the word chat, there's a Q&A tab and you can ask questions in there which we can respond to that specific question. Like I mentioned before, I'll do my best to respond to questions as they pop up, but I'll hold any questions that I don't know the answer to until the end and make sure that we get those answers responded to. If you're having any technical issues, we've we've heard there's sometimes a technical issue if you're tuned in on your cell phone. Um, if you have any technical issues, then please try refreshing the screen um, or leaving the webinar and rejoining, and that resolves most of the issues that we've seen in the past. So if you continue to have technical issues, go ahead and drop in the chat, and I'll do my very best to help troubleshoot that as we go forward. We want to make sure that this is helpful for everyone. We want to make sure this is educational for everyone. So if there's something in particular that you have a question on, please don't hesitate to drop that in the chat or in the Q&A tab, and we'll do our best to make sure that that question is answered for you. So that is all of our housekeeping items. So at that this point, uh, I'll turn the time over to Micah. Micah, please, if you want to give yourself a little bit more of an introduction and uh, catch us up on caching and what it means and how to utilize it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so just a little bit more background. I've been working with WordPress for over 15 years at this point. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we run into all the time is, um, you know, people who don't understand caching or don't know how to work with it or having just weird issues and not sure how to address them. And so this whole presentation is essentially um, just kind of my my history in working with caching with with different people um and so we're trying to make sure that we can bring this down to a level where everyone can understand it not just the technical people um so while i am a very technical person um i'm going to try to try to try to do this as clean and and plain and simple as i can so yeah so we'll have a bunch of different uh things we're going to try to cover so obviously we're gonna talk a little bit about what caching is for anybody that doesn't know, um, why you might want to cache your site, uh, what types of caching there are, um, some of those best practices and other things that might be related to caching, but indirectly um, in a performance sense. 
and then um, a few other things uh, along the way. So let's take a look first at what exactly is caching. So uh, if we were to give it a definition, we're, the definition is to temporarily store something so that uh, like a resource so that future requests can be served faster. So <clears throat> um, thinking about it from a day-to-day -day standpoint, we actually cache things every day without even thinking about it, uh, but not necessarily on the web, right? So for me, I like to make omelets every morning for breakfast. Um, and so obviously one of the ingredients for that is an egg. So in order to... Uh, make an omelet, I have to have eggs somewhere nearby that I can use to crack into the pan. And if they are not nearby, then that is a problem, right? If I had to go to the grocery store every morning to get an egg, to bring it home <laughs> to crack it, uh, that that would probably change what I eat for breakfast. Uh, so caching, essentially, being going to the grocery store, caching an egg in my refrigerator, and then being able to pull it out, uh, is a very simple example of caching. And of course, if you think about it, if you go to the grocery store, technically the grocery store is also caching uh, eggs because they get them from various locations all throughout the country from uh, farmers. And so uh, anyway, I think that's a pretty clear example of caching in the sense that we just need something ready and available that we can use without having to go through all the work and effort every single time to go you know grab whatever that thing is so essentially with wordpress we're doing the same thing so we've got wordpress is doing all this work to generate a page or uh, some you know piece of work that it's trying to do to do and all we're doing is we're saying okay well if we've put this page together for somebody already why don't we just keep it handy for the next person that comes along so that we don't have to do all that work again um, so then there's that another aspect to caching, right? So we have the concept of caching something, but then we have this, the concept of cache invalidation, uh, which would be expiring a cache resource. So another day-to-day -day example, um, is going to the fridge, right? Grabbing the milk out and trying to figure out whether it's still good. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's can be a little bit subjective, right? Like, uh, you know, there's a date that they put on there, but that doesn't mean that it's bad on that date. It could go bad before or after, um, all those kinds of things. Cash invalidation is kind of the same way that there's a lot of different reasons why things might expire from a cash. Uh, and in some cases it'll expire exactly on the date or time that it's set to, uh, and other times it may expire because other things just kind of pushed it out. Um, so we'll kind of look at that a little bit, but think about it kind of like the milk, right? Like there's a number of reasons why, or <laughs> your milk might go bad, you know, if it got left out or, um, you know, various different reasons. So we'll take a look at um, the invalidation a little bit more as well, but those are kind of the two main concepts, right? The, the initial caching of something and then the invalidation of that cache. So, so that's kind of the basic concept. So we want to dig in a little bit into why would we ever want to do caching in the first place, right? So there are a few things that caching can help with. Uh, I think most people understand that caching is going to help make your website faster. Uh, if you're able to make the website faster with caching, it's because, um, like we said, we're doing less work to generate a page, which means we're using less resources uh, behind the scenes to generate that page, which means that the resources we do have will be more readily available to handle more traffic. So faster website, uh, more server resources that can handle more traffic. And then of course, faster website also equals better SEO. Because as we know, Google is looking at how fast your site loads, as well as um, some other metrics around site speed and that kind of thing. And then we have the user experience, which is improved because if you happen to have a site that 
takes more time to load and you can speed that up for the user. They're less likely to churn or leave your site. Uh, so essentially they've done studies and I believe it was something like Walmart. They changed the, uh, they, they were able to get some ridiculously minuscule um, performance optimization that was like a half second, uh, but it influenced sales significantly because fewer people left that just fraction of a second meant that they actually made more sales, which equated to millions of dollars because obviously it's a big company. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, good things can come from caching. And, it, and not every site is going to need to cache necessarily. Uh, you know, generally it has to do with, do you have a lot of traffic and is your site slow in the first place? And caching isn't a band-aid for a slow website. It is good to try to figure out, you know, are there things on my site that I can do to improve performance in the first place? And if so, by fixing those, you know, then throwing caching on top of that, it's just going to be even faster. So that's kind of the, the goal there. So we're going to jump into a few of the different types of caching, kind of wrap our head around, you know, what, what are they? What are the pros and cons? When do you want to use one or not use one? Uh, those kinds of things. <clears throat> so we're going to take a look first at the browser cache. So the browser cache, and again, as we're looking at these caches, these different types of caching, we're looking at it from the standpoint of let's start at the cache that's closest to the user and then work our way backwards to the cache that's furthest away from the user. And by that, I mean, you know, we have the computer that is sitting in front of you versus the um, server that's hosting the website somewhere else. Um, so we're going to kind of work through it in that order. So the browser cache is essentially uh, files that are actually stored on the user's computer. So if I go to bluehost.com and uh, that site loads up, if, the, if I'm using browser caching, then some of those files will be saved on my computer so that as I go to subsequent pages on the site, uh, those resources are already on my machine. So we don't have to do the extra work of going back to the uh, figure out where that file lives and go fetch it again, right? So that's <clears throat> that's essentially what the browser cache is. And of course, when we're talking about invalidation, the um, invalidation is handled by uh, cache control uh, headers or it can be manually flushed by the users. Um, so it puts the control more on the user side of things to, to clear that out. Um, so typically when we're talking about WordPress, browser cache is gonna be used more useful for things like static files, such as images or um, files that control the styling or kind of the front end functionality of the site, as opposed to like the back end uh, functionality, um, which is a little different. So, <clears throat> so that's our browser cache. And so next we're going to kind of step it back just a little bit, right? So we have the computer right in front of us, and then we have the website, which is hosted somewhere else, right? Could be on the other side of the country, could be on the other side of the world, could be a city over. Um, <laughs> so there is a step in between there, right? Where we say, okay, well, just because the server that's hosting my website lives in Utah doesn't mean that um, I have to fetch everything from Utah, right? So what we're basically doing is we're saying, okay, well, let's say I have an image and I want to load that on my website. We can use a CDN, which is a content delivery network, and we can load that file through the CDN. And what the CDN is basically doing is saying, okay, well, you know, your server's over here in Utah. Well, I can grab these images and we can spread those out to hundreds of locations around the entire world. So if somebody's coming to your site from China, 
they don't have to go all the way to the other side of the world to get that image, right? They can just go to whatever the local nearby location is for that file and grab it from there. So a CDN is literally just, it's kind of acting like a, a grocery store per se, <laughs> where it's saying, okay, well, you know, we have all these things from different places and we're pulling them all into one place, but we also sell it everywhere, right? So we can say, okay, we've got our, we've got our images and we're going to spread them out around the world and make it just easier. And as you change an image on your site, then the CDN gets updated and they populate those changes out um, so that everybody sees the latest stuff. And you can set policies and different things on how long you want files to stay there before it'll automatically refetch them from the source from your website. Um, or you can manually purge those things as well. Uh, so we have the browser cache on the computer. The CDN, which is just like spreading it out around the world, which I like the image here we have of the lady with the dandelion, right? Just spreading, spreading all those things out. Um, and then we have page caching. So this is what most people think of when we talk about caching, is the idea of taking an entire web page and caching it, making it available in its completed state for reuse. Um, <clears throat> So an entire page is generated and it's usually based off of the URL. So whatever the URL is, when you type it into the browser, that is the, the thing that we use to figure out what page to serve up, right? So we'll cache a page that matches the URL. And then if somebody else calls that same URL, they'll get that same page that we've cached. Um, so in the event that a requested page is not in the cache or something triggers cache busting, then the request is going to pass through to the server. Um, so they're, you know, again, talking about the invalidation, um, cache busting is a lot of times like maybe making some minor changes to the URL to force it to go back to the source and get some information. Um, so page caching, full page. Um, and so this is basically consolidating that work of generating the entire page. Then we go even a little further, right? So we just went from, okay, so we're caching things on the server where our website lives. Uh, and then the other side of the coin here is we have WordPress, which is communicating with the database. And the database is where when we type our content into WordPress, that content gets stored into the database. And so when WordPress is trying to put together a page, it will um, it will use the WordPress code and any plugins and things that you have running, as well as your theme. And it'll take that data and it'll intermingle them. And that's how it generates the page. So if for some reason we're not able to cache an entire page, then one thing we can do is we can use what's called object caching. I like to use the term data caching, but that's not like a common <laughs> common phrase, but it's a little more aligned with the idea of what's happening. Uh, so a data cache is we have a database which contains all this information that we've input into WordPress. And uh, the object cache is essentially a faster way of getting this, the data that we need than having to necessarily go all the way back to the database and run complicated queries and things that may take a long time. So <clears throat> on average, you know, WordPress makes a lot of requests to the database. And I've seen in some cases like 600 plus uh, requests happening to the database. Uh, and some of those requests are just really complicated queries that take a long time and take a lot of extra overhead. So again, that's adding to the amount of time that it takes for WordPress to return a page in general and is slowing your performance down. So object caching will help speed that up. So basically all that kind of gets stored as key value pairs. Um, that's not super important. It's just a faster way of getting at your data. Uh, and then some of those objects have expirations uh, in terms of like a specific date and time that they are no longer valid. And then it'll 
you know, go back to the database and then keep a copy of that where it's easily accessible. Um, and then sometimes the memory gets full and it pushes items out of this cache. And then, you know, you ha it has to do the work again. So <clears throat> with object caching, um, you're basically caching the database. Uh, and so this is typically provided by your web host. And then we're gonna take a quick look here at some of the best practices. Uh, so what are the things that you need to keep in mind, the, the common problems that most people run into when they do cache their website, um, or as we've just learned all the different types of caching. So first thing to keep in mind is that caching is an enhancement that provides better performance. Uh, like we said, it's not a Band-Aid that you wanna slap on a website that is slow in the first place. So you wanna make sure that you do as much as you can to speed your site up before you implement caching. And then that way, caching is just a further enhancement of that. Uh, don't look at it from the perspective of, if I implement caching, my site will be fast, um, because that's not always the case. You can implement page caching and different things, but if your web host, for example, is slow, or your plugins are taking up too much time to do what they need to do because you've put some bad plugins in, then what's gonna happen is you're just gonna have a slow site. Even with caching, uh, it's gonna take extra time to return that uh, page, uh, depending on how that caching is implemented. So make sure that you actually try to speed up your site as best you can. One of the easiest ways to do that is to go look at the list of plugins that you're using and just ask yourself, is this something I need active and on my site to run my site? Like, is this a core uh, plugin that I absolutely must have or can I do without it? Um, and sometimes you have to have a particular plugin, but then if you find out, for example, it's not a very fast or performant plugin for some reason, you can look at alternative plugins. Uh, worst case scenario, maybe you have somebody create a custom custom plugin that's actually fast. Uh, but in most cases, uh, it's just a matter of taking a good look at your plugins and asking yourself, is this something I need? Or is this something I could do without? So the other thing is that caches have limits. So you cannot cache everything, just like we were talking about, for example, with the object cache. You know, you might have some small uh, two megabyte uh, amount of storage space for a cache, right? And when that gets full and something else needs to be put in there, it's going to have to kick something out to make space for it. So you can't cache everything. Uh, so you have to be careful about, um, about trying to do that. Um, and in most cases, if you have good plugins and things on your site that are well developed, you won't have this problem. But again, going back to maybe double check your plugins and how they're working and all of those kinds of things, uh, it's possible to have plugins that are poorly written, which are basically either caching so many things that they're kicking everything out and almost making the, the cache useless, or um, it's completely just not using the cache in the first place, which is also just as bad. So uh, things, things to keep an eye out for. So caching is often a balance uh, between performance and data freshness. And this is kind of where it's up to you to decide, um, am I more concerned about having the website be fast or am I more concerned about data being real time, essentially, right? So if I make a change on my site, for example, is it okay if that change waits for an hour before it shows up on my site? Is it okay if that change waits for a day? Uh, if it absolutely must be there in 60 seconds, uh, then you know, you're probably leaning away from caching and more towards um, just whenever the data is available and it's new and updated, you wanna show it immediately. So, so those are some of the decisions that you end up having to make. And they don't have to be made website-wide, right? You might say, okay, well, 
performance is absolutely important. So caching is the most important thing, except for on these three pages on my website, I have to have the data right away. So you can have those options when you're doing caching by excluding certain pages from the cache, things like that. Uh, but just keep in mind that you're going to have to make this decision between how heavy do I go with caching versus how much do I really need to have fresh data on the site. So one of the other things is very common that I see a lot is people will, essentially people think that more caching plugins equals more caching equals faster site. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, and while there may be certain use cases that it does make sense to have multiple caching plugins, you do not want to have the same types of caching enabled in more than one plugin. Because if you do that, then you're going to create some very strange uh, interactions <laughs> between uh, your caching plugins. And it's just going to frustrate you more than anything else. Uh, so make sure that if you have a caching plugin, that you just use the one caching plugin. If you know that one plugin does a particular type of caching and another plugin does a different type of caching, it's okay to use them together. But if, for example, there's some overlap in the functionality, you may need to make sure that you have a particular type of caching turned off in one plugin if you do end up using multiple plugins for some reason. As a general rule, I just tell people it's best to have a single plugin that handles your caching because if you put two of them on there, somebody at some point is going to go in and try to configure something, and then they're going to not realize the other one is there, and then things are going to get real weird. Uh, so always better just to go with one really good caching plugin that you like and stick with that. So the other thing we don't want to do is cache any traffic for logged in users. Uh, in most cases, if you cache uh, content for a logged in user, you're exposing yourself to some issues. Um, and so this kind of leads into the, uh, oh, no, not that one. Um, so the issues that we're looking at um, are basically, okay, well, let's say I'm logged in and I'm on an e-commerce site and I've just put um, something into my cart and I'm going to the checkout page. Um, and, you know, I'm the first person to go to this checkout page. And so that visit gets cached. So the caching is, is caching me as a logged in user going through an e-commerce checkout. Well, the next time that somebody, if we cache that, right, uh, the next time that somebody comes through and they end up on the checkout page, guess what they're going to see? Well, A, they're not going to see all the products and things that they put into their cart. Um, and they're also not going to see their own name or address or phone number or credit card number, <laughs> right? Like they may see uh, all of this information, this private information on these pages. So most WordPress plugins will not actually cache anything for logged in users. They do give you the option, but if you enable it for things like e-commerce sites, you're putting yourself at a big risk of just accidentally putting your customer's data at risk. So <clears throat> that's something you have to be very careful about. Uh, and so that's why we say just, just don't cache it for logged in users unless you really know what you're doing um, and know kind of the, the things that are at risk there. Uh, another thing to be careful of, so with dynamic data, right? So think of a normal web page where it's like a home page and stuff doesn't change a whole lot. Caching, that's not a problem because it's basically going to be the same for everybody. Um, but there might be some content on pages that change, right? Like maybe you have some sort of like uh, search functionality um, or some sort of like... Um, well, I have a site, uh, Programmer Joke of the Day, by the way, if you want to go look at it, look it up. Uh, so that site on the homepage, it gives you a completely random joke. Um, 
well, actually the homepage gives you a joke of the day, but there is another page that gives you a completely random joke. Um, <clears throat> so from a caching standpoint, right, if my homepage has a new joke every day, I can cache it for potentially 24 hours, probably less just to be safe. Um, but if I try to cache my page is supposed to be totally random, then that's that's not going to work very well. Um, but when we're talking about dynamic caching, it is possible to have things on the page that are go into different states. And if you base it off of URL parameters, again, we're having a unique URL per each variation of the page, then that, that kind of caching mechanism works really well. Um, but again, if you have a situation where the URL doesn't change, but the content does, then it's probably better just to not cache that particular page, um, which again, you can, most plugins can just say this page URL, whatever the address is, you know, exclude it. So when we're talking about caching, there are some other uh, things that we kind of hear about that are performance related, but not necessarily specific to caching. Uh, but I think because most caching plugins integrate these types of features, it's important to talk about these because A, these are things that you will definitely want to consider when you're actually dealing with the performance of your site. And since we usually lump performance and caching together, um, talking about performance in general, I just want to make sure we cover some of these concepts. So the first one here is what we call minifying. So minifying is basically altering text in a file to take up less space. So if you think about, for example, a Word document or a Google Doc or something that has just like uh, text content in there, uh, minifying is basically going in and saying, okay, well, we don't need line breaks between paragraphs. We don't need to end in paragraphs. We don't need to put spaces between words. <laughs> um, you know, we're just gonna mash all this together. Uh, now, of course, if you take out all the spaces, it's going to get really hard to read. Um, so that <laughs> that changes the functionality and the readability, right? Uh, so minifying is similar to that, except you know it's it's like not exactly taking the spaces out. Like it's still a readable, usable thing by the computer. Uh, it just takes out all the unnecessary extra space from the file, so that it can take up less space, which means it can transmit over the web faster because it's smaller. Um, and it is possible to remove white space without necessarily moving, removing spaces. White space also includes tabs and other things, right? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what minifying is, is just saying, okay, we have this type of file. Let's take out all the stuff we don't really need and make it as small as we can. Um, and then we have something called concatenation which is where we say, okay, I've got a bunch of files of the same type. Uh, it's kind of like saying, okay, well, I've got a, three Word documents, right? They're all on the same topic. Let's just put them all together in one file. Maybe you can have a heading or something that separates like, okay, this is article one, article two, article three, but it's all in the same document, right? Um, that's basically what concatenation does is it takes files of the same type and mushes them together into one large file. So now instead of uh, your browser having to make three, four or more requests, it could do it in a single request. Now, on average, your browser can handle about, I think eight requests at a time. And a lot of sites will load more than eight, for example, files that are specific to the look and feel of the site, right? So being able to combine those into a single file means instead of the browser having to make multiple round trips to get all these different files, it can fetch all of the one all of the files of one type in a in a single go, along with potentially other types of files as well. So concatenation is an important concept and definitely beneficial. Um, as far as the people always want to find out how safe is it to enable certain features, right? So if we're talking, let's say, minification, um, minification is usually pretty safe. 
Uh, concatenation is a little bit less safe, usually pretty safe, but um, it also depends on the type of files you're dealing with, right? So we have two main types of files that you're going to see where we can use minification and concatenation. One is CSS, which is essentially the styles associated with the site. So it changes the look and the colors and all those kinds of things. And then we have JavaScript or JS files, which essentially handle the user interaction on the site itself um, in terms of if you're on the same page and you click here and this thing pops up, like all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you do it for CSS, it's usually a lot safer. Um, but because there's functionality involved with JavaScript, uh, it gets a little bit more risky. Usually you can turn it on and if everything looks fine, you're probably good. But if you do start to see some weirdness of like, I'm clicking and this thing that used to pop up doesn't pop up anymore, then chances are you might want to disable that and see if it works. Uh, because if sometimes things get out of order, maybe they didn't quite get in the right order, um, then, then it can break some stuff. So concatenation. Um, and again, this is all the kind of stuff you want to figure out before you cache. Because if you get the concatenation wrong and you cache it, now you're like, oh, well, let me turn the concatenation off. And then you test it and it's still broken, but that's because it's cached. Um, if it wasn't cached, you would see that it, turning it off fixed it, right? So we want to make sure that we nail down kind of these peripheral things before we actually implement a true cache. That way we don't end up with a lot of frustration trying to make our site faster and end up just breaking a bunch of stuff. And then we just give up on caching altogether and write it off as something that like, I, I just can't do it. It breaks my site. So something I see a lot. And so just understanding these concepts and making sure that you do certain things before the other uh, is a big help. And then we have um, compressing which is a little different. It is basically removing redundancy in a file. So just like you can take a bunch of files and throw them into a folder and zip up that folder on your computer, that folder is going to take up a lot less space because it's been compressed. And the way that that compression works is basically we say, okay, well, um, you know, maybe, maybe the, the word, just as an example, if you have a word document and maybe the word authentication shows up a bunch of times in that document, right? Well, maybe we we create a special uh, abbreviation like A-U-T-H, auth, for that, uh, for that word. So now it takes up less space and we can replace all these instances with a smaller version. And so we use the word so much and we abbreviated it to four letters, it eliminates a lot of space in the document. So you do that over and over again with different things. And that basically compresses the file and makes it take up less space. So we have <clears throat> compression that happens before files are sent over uh, from your web host to your website, wherever it's being shown on somebody's computer. Um, so this compression will compress all the things, send them across the wire, and then the browser knows how to uncache it. It's called gzip compression. Uh, so that's kind of the, the common compression mechanism that happens. Um, and so that's something that you would like to make sure is working because if it is, it's going to make your site a lot faster. I've seen a lot of times where it's like, okay, we have a one megabyte file and we could just send it across the wire. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, I try to make sure that uh, an entire web page is <laughs> maybe one megabyte uh, so, so if you have a megabyte, uh, you don't want to just send it across the wire. Uh, you can compress it, and maybe it takes up 500 kilobytes, and then it sends it over, and the browser turns it back into a mega, megabyte on the other end. Um, and likewise with images, when we talk about optimizing images, um, images, image, different file formats for images actually have compression built in. So... Um, you can potentially change file types or within a particular type of image file, there can be different algorithms or things that might be used to optimize it. Uh, so a lot of the uh, image optimization tools um, 
can can handle essentially the compression for your images. Uh, so when we're when Google tells you you need to optimize your images, then that's that's basically what we're looking at. Um, and then we have lazy loading, which is basically where we don't load images until the user scrolls down to where that image comes into view. Um, so that's another feature that that you can turn on. So let's take a quick look at implementation options. <clears throat> so um, first and foremost, uh, again, we want to be careful that we're not implementing multiple caching mechanisms that are of the same type. So it's important to understand what your web host offers and if there's any gaps, uh, how to fill those, what plugins you might need, all those kinds of things. So if your site's on Bluehost, we do have a caching plugin. Um, it is the Bluehost plugin and there is a performance section where we do have caching and you can choose from the caching level. It actually does a few different types of caching uh, based off of your selections. Um, but we do offer offer that. So it's important to be aware of what your web host offers. Uh, each web host has or may not have at all uh, a way for you to handle caching. So uh, pay attention to that. Also know that there's things like Cloudflare out there which sit between the website and the server and can also do some caching related things. Um, so Cloudflare offers a CDN, they do browser caching and page caching and a bunch of different things. Uh, Cloudflare is an amazing tool. I like to use it. Um, but again, you have to just know at which, at which layer <laughs> um, and what type of caching you have going on. Um, so it's possible to turn things off on Cloudflare if you want to allow a plugin to do something or turn a feature off on a plugin to let Cloudflare do it. Um, so you just want to be careful that you're, you know, only one thing is doing page caching. Only one thing is doing browser caching. Um, so in one of the more popular plugins that are out there for caching, uh, this one's a paid plugin, but it's called WP Rocket. Personally, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it does a really good job about keeping the uh, the user interface uh, for configuring things very simple and straightforward, but also not so simple that you can't do what you need to do. Uh, so the other great thing about having a paid plugin that handles this is that it will allow you to reach out to support, which is not necessarily something you get to do with free plugins. There is a support uh, for free plugins on WordPress.org, but that doesn't guarantee that the plugin authors are going to get back to you. Um, so uh, this one is a really, really good option. And if you're looking to do some caching, it also integrates perfectly well with Cloudflare, which also has their, you pay a little extra on Cloudflare to get their uh, APO, which is their automatic performance optimization specifically for WordPress. And if you have that and WP Rocket, you're pretty well off. Um, so that's one good combination that I think works really well. Uh, there is a plugin, when we're talking free plugins, in terms of plugins that have the most functionality, W3 Total Cache has the most options and, and tools. If you know what you're doing, it's wonderful. If <laughs> you're an average person who just needs to have caching, you do not want to use W3 Total Cache. It, has so many options, it will confuse the mess out of you. Uh, so unless you know what you're doing, while this is free, uh, you either have a professional configure it for you, or you, uh, you understand it yourself, or you get somebody else, or use something else. So W3 Total Cache aside, WP Fastest Cache is another really, really good option. It's a free plugin. It has a lot of the features. It gives you a much simpler interface, but it still gives you plenty of options uh, for how you want to control things. Another option is WP Super Cache. This one is a free plugin from Automatic, and it's even simpler. Um, but again, it, it does get to be a little bit limiting depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but it 
a lot of its um, complexities is kind of hidden away. There is a little bit more complexity there, but uh, but if you're looking for something very straightforward, this one's a good option. And then uh, another uh, plugin is Comic Cash. Uh, they do have a paid version if you want some more uh, features, but uh, that one is also a good option. So, uh, yeah, and then we have the cache enabler, uh, which is literally like turn it on, turn it off. <laughs> uh, so if if you really just want to want a, a stupid simple uh, plugin, uh, that one is a good way to go as well. So. Then we have, uh, this one is WP Optimize. Now, if you're looking for things that can help you optimize your database and clean things up, like tables left behind old plugins, that's originally what this plugin was was created for. So it is one of the best database optimization tools, which is not really a caching tool, but uh, optimization. And since they've added on a bunch of caching and other performance tools, so this is also another good tool uh, to look into. Uh, and then we have auto-optimize, auto um, which is another one that was originally just meant to do like minification and concatenation. And it was kind of the go-to for some of those things. Uh, they too have added some more features as well. Um, and then when it comes to image optimization, there's a few options. The free plugin that I think most people use is Smush. Uh, it's a free plugin. It implements lazy loading. It allows you to kind of optimize and compress those images. Um, as you upload images in WordPress, it will automatically optimize those. But if you have a bunch that are already there, you have to go through their bulk op optimizer to optimize that. And I think they only let you do 50 images at a time or whatever. Um, and then there's a tool called Imagify, which is a paid plugin, or it's a free plugin with a paid word, uh, paid service. Um, but it is a really great tool, um, you know, and you can bulk optimize uh, all your stuff and then it'll handle the optimization as it goes as well. So another really good option also happens to work really well with WP Rocket. So I think um, that covers most of it. So I'm sure there's questions. So Devin, I guess uh, if we want to open up the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Micah. Got a couple questions here, um, and uh, we've got a little bit of time, so let's get through as many as we can in the time that we have. So the first question I have here is, how do I determine if my website needs caching, and when is the right time to implement it? Yeah, so <clears throat> generally, if you're just starting out and building in a website, I would say don't worry about caching at all. Uh, I mean, unless your web house does that automatically for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, you probably don't need it uh, if you're just small starting out, don't have a lot of traffic. Uh, if you notice your website is getting slow, caching can help. But again, it's not a Band-Aid, so maybe look at some of the other things. And then if uh, if your traffic you know, starts to grow, you will probably notice real quick that uh, that traffic whether it's not whether or not it's going to impact your uh, site speed, and so when it starts to impact your site speed, this is a good time to start looking into the best ways to cache your site. And when you say impact your site speed, do you have like a metric that you like to look at, or a tool that you like to use to tell when your site speed is in, impacted, or do you just kind of go by general feel when you're looking at how quickly your site is loading? Yeah, so there. Uh, I think one of the easiest tools for most people to use is something called uh, PageSpeed. Well, the, the website is pagespeed.web.dev. And so if you go there, you can just put in your URL for your page or your homepage for your site, whatever you want to measure. And then it will automatically go through and do a check on mobile and a check on desktop. And it'll tell you, you know, here are specific performance issues we found. Here's your core web vitals. Uh, so this is Google's tool that they give you to kind of check on the status of things. Uh, if you happen to be familiar with Chrome developer tools, they have it, a tool called Lighthouse that's built into the browser that you can use as well. Um, but this is their web version that they let you just type in your URL. So it's pretty easy to use. Cool. Awesome. So that's the best way. <laughs> uh, next question is, 
how can I clear or purge the cache on my WordPress site when I make updates or changes to the content? Yeah, so if you need to purge the cache, again, it depends on the type of cache, right? So you have to understand where, <laughs> where the cache lives, right? Like maybe you have Cloudflare that's doing caching, you have to go to Cloudflare to clear it, unless you have the Cloudflare plugin, which can clear it for you. Um, so every plugin that you use is going to have it in a different place. And so you probably have to look up the documentation on whatever plugin you're using and say, okay, well, if I go to the admin bar and I click this, it'll purge it or clear it, which is most common. Uh, you know, it's going to be in the admin bar when you're logged in, you should be able to flush everything or flush a particular page that you're on. Um, so that is, uh, I think there was a second part of the question though, besides purging, what was that? Um, it was clear or purge caching when you make updates or changes to the content. So I think it's, yeah, yeah I think it's updates so the, leads to purging. The, yeah, the other part of it outside of actually having to do the purging, most well-written caching plugins should automatically purge when you update your content. They should clear out the page that was updated. Some plugins aren't as good and may may only clear that particular page and maybe not like the category pages it shows on or the home page if it shows there things like that. So sometimes you do have to go clear the cache for those reasons. But again, sometimes it's a misconfiguration. Um, if you change some settings, it might might work better. So yeah, that's okay. a short, short answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really appreciate your ability to distill this technical information in a way that, that I can understand it. And I'm sure that our, our uh, audience can understand it as well. Um, the next question that we have, are there any considerations for e-commerce websites when implementing caching, especially with dynamic content? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's the thing with e-commerce is there's so much going on that sometimes, like, there's things you do want to cache, things you don't want to cache. Um, usually, you can cache, uh, you can cache all of your um, product pages and things like that because they're not really going to change. Um, but when it comes to caching, like cat, you know, shopping carts or <laughs> checkout pages or things like that, um, most plugins that you get off the shelf are going to automatically disable caching for some of those pages like that, that where we really don't want to be caching. Right. Um, so usually you don't have to worry about it, but it is good, especially if you're doing an e-commerce site to just double check, you know that something is or is not being cached there. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there is a website. It, it's something, if you just Google, is my web page cached? There's a tool, I think, that's that allows you to just put in a URL and it tells you whether it's cached or not. Um, right. Something like that could be very helpful just to kind of double check that kind of thing. Right, because uh, I, I mean, you, you basically covered it, but also like if your inventory is presenting like a cache site and it says, hey, there's still five more left. If you're sold out and your website is showing a cache version, that could obviously yeah. run into complications. And, and that's where sometimes turning off page caching and making sure you have really good object caching that's gonna serve things up faster behind the scenes, but maybe not serve the same markup, the same display all the time. Got it. Um, a good option. Okay. Uh, the next question we have, what are some common caching related issues that WordPress users encounter and how can they be resolved? Yeah, I think the biggest frustration is when somebody makes a change on the site and they go to the front end and the old content still shows <laughs> and then they have to go purge the cache and all those kinds of things. Um, and usually it's one of two things. It's either they're running two caching plugins that are competing for each other on a particular caching type, like page caching, uh, or they are um, um, misconfigured in some way that it's not properly auto auto clearing the cache when you update pages, that kind of thing. So those are usually the the two big things that I look at first, uh, because the thing you don't want to do is end up changing something and then purging the entire site cache. Um, because that slows your entire site down until people visit all the pages associated with it. Um, <laughs> so if you can avoid that, or, or at least if you really do have to purge things, don't purge the entire site, just purge the page that you are concerned about. And then that way you're not, you know, 
doing yourself a disfavor. Right. Okay. Um, and I think the last question or one or two more here, sorry. Uh, are there any situations where caching might not be suitable for a website? And you've already touched on at least one of these with the e-commerce site, but any situations where caching might not be suitable for a website and what alternatives are there? Yeah. So I think most of the kind of related concepts that we've covered, like the concatenation and minification and optimization of images and all these different things um, can definitely help. Um, <clears throat> and again, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes a certain type of caching is better than another. And sometimes they're better in combination, it just depends on your setup. So like for e-commerce, a good object cache is going to go a long way, even if you can't do page caching. Um, but again, like with e-commerce, you could still do page caching. It also just depends, you know, are you showing stock and things like that? Like how much is available on the site? Um, but again, like the, uh, you know, if you if you have everything cacheable and then you just realize that, oh, shoot, I want something totally random to show here. And I have a few plugins like that that I've written that uh, handle random image refresh or random post display or, you know, various things. Um, so those are the kinds of things where it's better to just go find your cache settings and plop in that URL and just say, ignore this URL when you're doing your cache. Understood. And I think the final question that we have here, and we're coming up on time, so this works out perfectly. How can I monitor and measure the impact of caching on my website's performance? Yeah, that one is where I think that page speed, uh, yeah, page speed .web dev URL is probably the best way to go. Uh, because again, it's not, um, that tool doesn't really care if the site's cached or not, it's going to give you recommendations. Uh, it's going to perform better if it's cached. Um, but again, like we said, caching is not a band-aid. So that tool is going to give you a list of things that you can tackle. And most of the time, um, just to save you a little bit of time, most of the time, one of the biggest things on that list of performance items is optimizing images. So if you have a good plugin that handles that, particularly nowadays, uh, converting images to what they call next-gen format, which basically means WebP, um, you know, having tools that do that. And WordPress has actually been working on some of that functionality as well. Um, so those are, those are the kind of performance things you want to look at before you actually implement your caching. But, uh, but yeah, like in general, that tool is going to help you figure out what you need to do next. Awesome. Well, I, uh, that's all the questions that I think we have for right now. Um, if I missed your question and didn't read it, then I apologize. I'll go back through and make sure that we covered them and we'll try to reach out and answer any questions that went unanswered. Micah, thank you so much for stopping by today and sharing your knowledge. I'm going to advance the slide to the next one just for anyone that has any other questions on how to get further assistance from Bluehost. We have our professional services that are available. We have our help channels. We have our YouTube page with a bunch of educational content on there, and we also have our technical support. So again, Micah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. This was very informative and, and helpful for myself, for sure, and, and I'm sure for others out there as well. So thank you, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you. I'll talk to you all later.